Louisiana Eats is brought to you with support from Zatarans, maker of New Orleans pantry staples like Creole mustard, fish fry, and jambalaya mix since 1889. Recipes and more at zatarans.com. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. When it comes to historic restaurants, there's no place like home, if you're lucky enough to call New Orleans home. The Crescent City is blessed with an abundance of restaurants with histories over a century old and tales too delicious to believe. We begin the delicious telling with Chef Chris Montero at the Napoleon House. As it turns out, Chris is not just an accomplished chef, but he's also a passionate preservationist and historian. We investigate the historic French Quarter property from the bar to the cupola and all points in between, including the former living quarters of the Empestado family. Then. We sit down with Chef Slade Rushing, who was given the daunting task of creating a 21st century culinary profile at the venerable Brennan's Restaurant on Royal Street, while honoring the tradition of breakfast at Brennan's as set forth by founder Owen Brennan decades ago. And sometimes it's the food itself that tells the story. That's the case at the Roosevelt Hotel, where Chef Carl Cushenberry's fried chicken is legendary. We visit Chef Carl in the kitchen there to learn what elevates his fried chicken to rock star status and get some cooking tips as well. We're taking a delicious trip back in time on this week's Louisiana Eats. My name is Chris Montero. I'm the general manager and executive chef of the Napoleon House. Over the course of his two-decade career with the Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group, Chef Chris Montero has played a major role in several notable ventures. He served as executive chef of Baco's in the French Quarter for 12 years, opened and ran Café B in Metairie, and more recently launched Cafe Noma in the Museum of Art, a project he continues to oversee and take great pride in. Now, at nearly 60 years old, Chef Chris's latest role as keeper of the historic Napoleon House is somewhat of a feather in the cap of his professional career. I'm a kid in the candy store right now, yes. With its funky European vibe and signature menu of items like Pim's Cups and Mufaladas, the Napoleon House was a place the New Orleans-born chef knew about his whole life. But his interest goes beyond the bar and dining room. As it turns out, Chris is a lifelong history buff and considers history, especially New Orleans history, to be his second greatest passion next to food. When he was chosen to be the executive chef of the iconic restaurant in 2015, he soon found himself engaging in over two centuries' worth of stories and lore centered around the two families that had previously owned it. It's kind of cool. 225 years of history, and the first 100 years was the Gerard family, and the second 100 years the Impostato family. And all of the history that I know was just word of mouth history from the impostados. Some of it, like most oral histories, it gets convoluted and crosses over and much like the history of my family, but a lot of it's inaccurate. And we've procured and hired a historic architect, Robbie Cangelosi. In the last three years since we've uncovered so much that we didn't know about the building. It's, It's absolutely fascinating. Chris met the Louisiana Eats crew in the Napoleon House Bar, where portraits of former employees and Napoleon Bonaparte line the walls. 
The chef was eager to give us a tour of the landmark and fill us in on its history, beginning with the transition of ownership from the Empastados to Ralph Brennan in 2015. The Impostado family had been running this all of their life. The, you know, the second generation, that was Sal Impostado and his four sisters, had been running this from the time they were children, and it's all they'd ever done, and those, they were getting kind of, kind of tired. You know, they're all in their mid-70s to early 80s, and uh, they were ready to pass this torch on. And what happened were we, as you probably know, regained and restored the original Brennan's restaurant on Royal Street, we being Ralph Brennan and the group. And while we were going through that restoration, there were a lot of articles being written, and you know, and most of them focused on Ralph's intent of retaining the family history and preserving that history, et cetera. And that caught the eye of Sal Impostato. And he reached out to Ralph Brennan, kind of behind the scenes, and said, you know, would you be interested in taking over my family's restaurant? With Ralph said yes, without <laughs> on the phone, without hearing any details. And that process took about a year, <laughs> the, the negotiations. No lawyers, no real estate, just Ralph and Sal and Pastato, old, old fashioned. But somewhere in that period, Ralph called me and said, Chris, do I, you can't say anything to anyone, but do I have a something for you? You're going to love it, right? Because I'm a history nut, always have been. I was a history major in college, and I've always been interested in New Orleans, not just culinary history, but I've loved the architecture and the culture and so on. And uh, he said, man, do I have a, something you're going to love, and it's going to be your retirement plan. So I was just thrilled and had no idea the breadth and depth of what was in this building. Guiding us through the decaying splendor of the restaurant's first floor, Chef Chris led us upstairs. Oh, this space. Formerly apartments, the space was converted to make room for private parties and receptions. Boasting carved wooden fireplace mantles, ornate chandeliers, and handsome doorways, the elegant rooms were beautifully preserved, as if they were suspended in time. So the first thing that was a big surprise to me was that the Napoleon House is a National Historic Landmark, and it's not by historical designation the Napoleon House. It's called the Gerard House, right? Nicholas Gerard was the original owner and proprietor of this business and this home, and he was a very prominent citizen in 1800 in New Orleans, the wealthiest family, the three Gerard brothers. He also has a distinction of being the first elected mayor to the city of New Orleans in 1812. We began building this property, the Gerard brothers, in 1797. The oldest parts of the building date back to the late 1700s, just after the last fires here in the French Quarter. And it was their business offices at first, and the corner was an open lot. And when the oldest brother died in the early 1800s, Nicholas Gerard wanted to build a residence on what was the business property. And that's where we're sitting right now. We're sitting in the apartment of Nicholas Gerard that was finished in 1812, which also was the year he was elected mayor of New Orleans. So not only was he a wealthy businessman, but he's the first elected mayor to the city. He's a Frenchman, right? You're gonna love this. He spoke no English. So the first mayor of New Orleans, after it became part of America, after the Louisiana Purchase, spoke no English. He really actually didn't have a lot of admiration towards Americans. And he said, they said, yeah, I want to do his inauguration in English. And he said, maybe these Americans should learn to speak French, right? <laughs> and he refused to speak any English in his inauguration. It's just a New Orleans thing, right? So this guy is the mayor of New Orleans in 1812. And then he's elected for a second term in 1814. Well, we all know what 1814 was in New Orleans. The beginning of the Battle of New Orleans, the end of 1814. January of 1815, the Battle of New Orleans takes place in Chalmette very historic event. Well, who's the mayor at the time is sitting here in the apartment we're in? This is Nicholas Gerard. He's also in charge of the Creole militia, and he was liaison to Andrew Jackson in helping to collaborate with the Creoles, the French-speaking Creoles, but really what he was instrumental in was he had these ties to Jean Lafitte and Dominic Yu. Uh, Dominic Yu was a general in Napoleon's army, one of the facts that come into play at the end of the story. So therefore, historians say that Gerard's involvement with Jackson was tremendously instrumental in this victory because of the people he was able to tie together with Jackson and his army from out of 
out of the state, and he had all the locals. We, we have this overwhelming victory in the Battle of New Orleans, and Gerard's even more popular here in the city amongst the Creoles. He gets all the credit with locals. The rest of the country, you know, and J Jackson goes on to become president and so on. But a few years later, Napoleon Bonaparte is captured a second time and exiled to a remote island in the, in the Atlantic, right? And uh, this is 1818, after Waterloo, right? His second big war campaigns that he's famous for, and he's captured, he's exiled to this remote island and around the city of New Orleans, that is a big deal. And the buzz starts going all around town. The reason that he's making this apartment more and more opulent all the time, he's adding a cupola to the roof and he's adding, doing restoration to these apartments on the top floor that no people have lived up there. The reason he's doing all these embellishments is to offer exile to Napoleon. They're going to they're gonna rescue him with Dominic Yu, right? Mm. And that story catches wildfire around the city. It's all the buzz. It's very well documented that everyone was talking about it. And then what happens? Napoleon, he kicks off up yeah. and dies, right? 1821, he dies suddenly. And there you have it, right? 200 years, it's been frozen in time. Everyone in the city were convinced that this was going to be Napoleon's house. So shortly thereafter, it began being referred to as the house Napoleon was going to live in, mm. right? And it just, it just never went away. We have 200 years of this great story. And hey, we don't know that it wasn't true because right. there's, no, there's no documentation of any discussions about it other than what the locals were talking about. Do you know much about what happened with the property between the Girards and the Impostadas? I know a bit. I mean, we're learning a lot more every day. So during the Girard era, it was owned by the family all the way until the late 1800s. Girard died just before the Civil War in his 80s. He's buried in St. Louis Cemetery right down the street, mm -hmm. very near Marie Laveau. But his family retained, his heirs retained the property until the turn of that century. And he left his enormous fortune to charity, the vast majority. He's one of the greatest philanthropists the cities have ever known, uh, Nicholas Gerard. Louis Armstrong was raised in an orphanage that was built with funds from Nicholas Gerard's fortune that he left to, uh, to these charities. But the rest of his family had lots of wealth also. There were other brothers. And they retained the property until the late 1800s when we'll, it's lost between 1900 and 1912. And we're going to figure it out when it changed hands with a couple of leases. So one of those leasees who we've not been able to identify started a little small grocery store, which is now the main bar of the Napoleon House. We know that because we've got a picture in the other room from 1906 that says, has a Labarde grocery, right? And we don't know who that is. And then in 1914, a young man, man by the name of Giuseppe Impostato, who was in his mid-20s, saved enough money, a Sicilian immigrant, very working class, to buy what was once the mayor's mansion here in New Orleans. Coming up next, our Napoleon House tour continues as Chef Chris Montero shares the history and culinary legacy of the building's 20th century owners, the Impostato family. Louisiana Eats returns after the break. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Rouse's Markets, from Camellia Brand, Beans Done Right, a New Orleans tradition since 1923, and from Ralph Brennan's Redfish Grill home of the award-winning barbecued oyster Poor Boy, and nine varieties of fresh gulf fish caught and served daily. Lunch, dinner, and private events at 115 Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. If you're just joining us, 
we've been touring the Napoleon House, an iconic New Orleans restaurant with over two centuries of history. Chris Montero, executive chef and history buff, has been on quite a tour of discovery since Sal Impostata handed over the Napoleon House keys to Ralph Brennan in 2015. Two generations of the Impostato family owned and operated the Napoleon House since 1920, when Giuseppe, Uncle Joe Impostato, purchased the home of former New Orleans Mayor Nicholas Girard. After Reconstruction, the French Quarter had transitioned from an opulent, cosmopolitan center to a working-class neighborhood with a large immigrant population. By the time Joe Impostato purchased the Napoleon House, so many Sicilian immigrants lived in the quarter that it was often referred to as Little Palermo. Uncle Joe, Giuseppe Impostato, this young man, had a dream of opening a Sicilian market. He wanted a grocery store. And that's originally what it was. We've got just a handful of pictures of the Napoleon House as a Sicilian grocery, you know, with canned tomatoes on the walls and little aprons. That started slowly in 1914, but we do know that before the Depression era, it had started selling sandwiches and wine and beer. There was some rumors of them distilling beer here, and that became a popular outlet for these Irish immigrants and the Italian workers. You know, a real roughneck working class kind of grocery slash bar, right? And apparently that really caught traction. In Prohibition, Uncle Joe started selling a little more wine. I do know that Uncle Joe brewed some beer. So that after Prohibition, it really the focus of the Napoleon House was a bar room. When did he carry the Victrola downstairs? Um, somewhere in the 30s. Uh, he's a, Uncle Joe, Giuseppe Impostato, is a huge fan of opera. That was his passion. And he started bringing the Victrola down into the, when it, when it started becoming a more popular bar and playing classical music. Look at the records. Those are Uncle Joe's records. Those are Uncle Joe's. Oh, my goodness. Walking through the banquet rooms on the second floor, Chris led us into a four-room apartment, the former home of Joe Impostato. This is where Giuseppe passed away in 1985 at 100 years old. And when he passed away, Sal and Vivian, who were running in in the 70s, uh, because he retired and... He retired in 1947, Joe, um, after the World War II, and left it to his baby brother, Peter, and, and his son, Sal. And they, they ran it all the way th- from the early 70s until reaching out to us. And Sal and his wife lived in what is now the banquet room in the front, and Uncle Joe lived in the back. And the moment Uncle Joe passed away at 100, a beloved family member, Sal said, finally, I can... <laughs> Create a banquet space in the bedroom because Uncle Joe wouldn't allow any commercial business in the family residence, right? This was all for family upstairs. My goal is to hopefully create Uncle Joe's apartment as a dining space. Oh, that right? would be great. And we'll do seated dinners in, in these back bedrooms, but they're amazing, right? And this is the old section of the building. We're standing above the 1700. Below this parquet floor are the old, old, some of the oldest flooring in, in, in the city of New Orleans, dating from the late 1700s. Also, directly below us was the Napoleon House's famous downstairs bar. I asked Chris to explain the story of how the Pimm's Cup cocktail came to be a classic menu item under Joe's leadership. A couple of things that transpired. He wasn't necessarily a fan of hard drinking and alcohol and whiskey drinking Irishmen. You know, he, he liked wine and beer and low alcohol. And he introduced a drink called a Pimm's Cup downstairs to the bar. He was familiar with this low alcohol drink from London. Uh, that was kind of a newfangled thing, apparently, when he was young. And he introduced Pimm's Cups to New Orleans. And we know this from the Pimm's folks that have a history that this was one of the first venues in America that started importing Pimm's, number one, because of Uncle Joe. So we like to give him all the credit, as the Pimm's people do, for being the largest distributor or sales uh, venue for Pimm's Cup in America, by far. There's nowhere close. So we're proud of that, right? Now, I know you must know the answer to this. When does the Muvalata appear here? Uh, it's a little convoluted, but this is what we know. Um, we know that he liked po' boys, uh, Uncle Joe. His cousin, 
owned the Union Bakery that made a lot of the Italian bread, the Italian twist, and the muffalata loaves. Uh, we know that Central Grocery takes credit, and rightly so, for introducing the muffalatas to New Orleans, but that was a, a relative of Giuseppe that sold the muffalatas. Somewhere in the 20s, he began selling more and more sandwiches. And, you know, the muffalata just had to be because it was his cousin that sold the loaf. And he wanted to sell it hot, though. He didn't think it needed to be a cold deli sandwich. And that's been our reputation ever since, right? But, you know, I'm a big fan of all of it. So we all we I strive to do here is to be as authentic and integral to those recipes. You know, Ralph Brennan told me something the day I started here. He said, our number one mission is to honor the legacy of the Impostato family. Uh, he is just enamored and loves the fact that uh, we were fortunate enough to keep this great entity going. And that's what we do. I, I, I make the original recipes. Next, Chris led us up a grand centuries-old staircase, taking us from the second to the third floor. On the next level, Chris showed us a number of apartments overlooking Charters and St. Louis streets. Oh my goodness, what a view. Looking around, I couldn't help but feel that with each staircase we climbed, we were going further back in time. Ascending the final staircase, the feeling was simply overwhelming. It was a place where time had stopped. And then we go into the real time warp now, right? Up into what we refer to as the attic. Well, tell me about this space. So this has been the most intriguing space and the one that we still are trying to sort out the details, but this is what we think we know. We're gonna, we're gonna determine a lot of this more in, uh, soon. When I got here, the impostato story of this space was the attic used to be dormitories for sailors in the 1800s, right? Because the Gerard family were in the import export and business on the river. But as soon as I brought an architect up here, an historic architect, he took one look and said, these were not, he said that maybe after the Civil War, pre-Civil War, these were slave quarters. Because A, the dead giveaway is these traditional servant stairs, which are here that go, what originally went all the way down to the ground floor. But since that presumption was made, I've done more research, and I've now come to identify the slaves who actually lived here. Oh, right? how in the world did you do that? I did that by Facebook and oh. social media and looking up a, a site of an author who wrote a fictional novel about Napoleon in New Orleans, but she had a thread of people that were communicating with her about her book, and one of them were descendants of Nicholas Gerard, who live in Evangeline Parish, where he had a large, apparently there are a lot of Gerard descendants in that area of the state. So we began communicating with them. Then I did some research from her book uh, about who were the slaves owned by Gerard, of which he had hundreds, but only three that lived in his apartment in Napoleon House. And here's where it gets really cool for me. There were two men and a, and a woman who lived up here in the third floor, and they were personal house slaves of Nicholas Gerard. And the daughter of the woman who lived here went on to marry Nicholas Gerard's nephew who inherited all of his property including the the big plantation. Now that was pre-Civil War was relatively unheard of that it wasn't uncommon for marriages or, or rather children from slave owners and slaves but for an aristocratic family to have married the daughter of a slave who lived up here is super cool, right? Yeah. Um, it kind of shows that, that of that era there was different mindset amongst some of the property owners and their descendants of this woman who lived here are the Gerard family that lives in Evangeline Parish. And the daughter who communicated with me did not know that. So she's coming soon to come visit where her great, uh, sixth great grandmother lived in 1800s. She's bringing the family tree, the genealogy tree, and we're going to trace everyone back here to this. This Incredible. Act. Incredible. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And we've just discovered that literally in the last six months. Our final destination was the jewel of this architectural crown, an octagonal cupola that provided us with a breathtaking view of the quarter and Mississippi River. So 
this was something that Gerard built as a bit of a fancy. Again, another area that we're trying to understand, like why did he build an Italian cupola on top of his Creole Spanish Caribbean architecture? Well, because of his business, in 1800, you'd have been looking right down on the wharf. And perhaps it was a business consideration, but some of the writings indicate that he was just showing off, right? Yeah. That he was envious of the cupolas on the, on the cabildo, and that he wanted to have the tallest residence in the city of New Orleans, which it was, um, because the only thing taller would have been the cathedral and the cabildo at the time. So uh, maybe he was just kind of flaunting his wealth at the time. But we don't know. Either way you look at it, this is one of the most integral aspects of the building. If you look at all the old paintings in the historic collection, they all feature the cupola on the roof. But we're really proud of it. We plan to take great care of it, and we're going to make sure it's around for another 100 or 200 years for people to experience. This is just fantastic. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure, as always. Chef, preservationist, and historian, Chris Montero of the Napoleon House. Historic New Orleans restaurants have an immortal way about them. Sometimes it feels as though they've been open for an eternity. But in our 300-year-old city, there comes a time when iconic restaurants need to be renovated and reborn. Such was the case when Brennan's restaurant underwent a major overhaul that culminated in the fall of 2014. With this renovation came new owners within the Brennan family and a new executive chef, Slade Rushing. We invited Slade into the studio to reflect on this pivotal transition in his career, starting from his first day on the job. We met at Brennan's while the construction was going on, and there were bobcats pushing dirt literally where our bar is. <laughs> and here's this historical property that... You know, a lot of times people say, hey, look, we're going to renovate this place or we're going to bring it back like it was or vice versa. And, and they go cheap on things. And I walk in and I see bobcats pushing dirt and I see all this amazing work that was being done. And it made me realize that these guys are the real deal. They, they really understand how to build a restaurant for success. And... In 2014, it was probably six to seven months before we opened the restaurant that things started moving towards the opening. Needless to say, we all watched closely in the news as the auctioning process went on. And because every New Orleanian, I believe, in essence, feels some ownership with places like Brennan's. So that's our spot. And at one point, one of the last things that was auctioned off was, of course, the name and recipes. Were there surprises in these archival recipes? The recipes that I looked at, and I looked at a few of them, I didn't want to be influenced by it too much. I don't know if that makes sense, but to me, there's a lot of good about not knowing. I grew up down here, and I've lived in a lot of places, and I, I used to eat this food so much growing up that I understood the passion and let's just say the substance of what makes good Creole food because my dad was a real estate broker and a lot of his clients came from the New Orleans area and this is back in the 80s they were buying land in Mississippi for weekend retreats and they would give him cookbooks and invite us over to New Orleans for Mardi Gras and to go eat at these nice restaurants and I think New Orleans was a really special place back in the 80s. Um, we had a lot of amazing European chefs and so forth. Let me just put it like this. Bananas Foster's is a classic example. There's certain things you just don't change about Brennan's. The Eggs Hussar is another example. I mean, we've we've elevated it, but we have given the best representation that I believe the dish. We put a lot of love in the dish. We use a blend of mushrooms, Hashimeji mushrooms, maitakis, and shiitakes, Instead of just one kind of mushroom, we we make a red wine sauce 
with amazing marrow bones and so forth. And other ones like the soft shell charters that I ran as a special today is a classic dish. We freshen up things, but they're, you know, it's just like when Alice and I were in New York, we knew the food tasted good down here, but it needed refinement. This is where I do so with respect. But when it comes to the customers, there are a lot of customers that remember Brennan's from back in the day, and it's changed. I would say probably 80% of them really love what we're doing because they can see the past and they can appreciate the innovation and they understand what we're doing and they appreciate the the service that we have and the space. It still is familiar enough to what they remember because we haven't changed Brennan's that much, the blueprint-wise. We've added some nice touches, some different styles of the room, but we've tried to retain the substance of what makes Brennan's. So, yes, innovation in the past, it's a balancing act, you know? Were you nervous? Oh, yeah, but see, if you don't have nerves, then <laughs> why are you living? stage frights everything, right? you got to have that adrenaline. you got to be nervous. I mean, I, nothing makes me tick more than pressure. I love pressure. I'm the guy that crams for the tests. That's what I like. That's why. That's what I enjoy. You must have been very nervous the day that Ella Brennan finally walked through the doors again. I, I suspect even Ralph must have been a little nervous that day. What was that like for you as the chef to know that Ella herself was coming back to Brennan's? It was very special. Ella called me over and wanted me to sit with her and she didn't want anybody else around and she leaned over to me and she told me a lot of things that I'm going to keep to myself about the opening of Brennan's and what Brennan's was to her and it was a special moment it was great to have her in that building and I didn't realize that she hadn't been back there in so many years it was one of those nights you know yeah you know, everybody's measure of the greatest achievement for American chefs is that James Beard Award. Well, since the day you hit the door at Brennan's, you've been getting that nomination. Do you think that it is harder for you because of the volume? Um, it's kind of funny because after a 600-person brunch or a 300-person dinner, it's... It takes a lot of work and a, a lot of people to trust. I have to trust a lot of people, a lot of chefs to execute that. And a lot of servers are cooking steak Diane tableside. I'm not cooking that, but I'm setting it up. I'm making the sauces. We're doing the preparations for it. Um, there's a lot of hands that touch the food, and I have to trust people. If I was cooking for, 30, for, for 20 or 30 people and touching every plate like – like chefs we hope to do, it might be a little bit easier to achieve that award, but I don't do what I do to get awards. I don't. I'm not really, that award wouldn't change me if I ever got it. I still am going to be the same person. I love what I do. Um, it's great to be nominated, but, you know, it, it is what it is. I, I don't let that, you know, I don't make excuses. I'm not, I don't really care that people, they do less numbers than me, and they win it. I don't think about any of that, you know. This is like um, two-a-days in football every day. Like when I was in Mississippi in August, sweating, this is two-a-days in football every day. And that's why I do it, because I love it, because I love the challenge. And I don't look down, never look down. I just keep looking forward. I keep pushing my chefs for success. And hopefully we'll get there. And my cooks, too. You know, I, 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 t I love teaching them, and I'm passionate every day. I don't let – it's funny. I've been doing this for a while, and some people say I'm burned out. You know, I've had moments where I thought I was burned out before, but I'm not burned out. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I feel like I'm hitting my best stride culinary-wise. Like, I'm getting comfortable with what I know, and I'm learning to take things off the plate and just trust the beauty of ingredients more. 
so I'm, I'm very happy, you know? That was Slade Rushing, executive chef at Brennan's. Does New Orleans boast the oldest restaurant in the nation? Stay tuned, and we'll answer that question when we come right back. Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen and Zatarans. Have you caught our Louisiana Eats Quick Bites podcasts yet? Visit poppytooker.com to subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also easily webcast any of the Quick Bites or Louisiana Eats episodes right from your computer on poppytooker.com. And now, back to Louisiana Eats. Here's this week's culinary quiz question. Brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. Does New Orleans boast the oldest restaurant in the nation? Actually, no. That distinction belongs to Delmonico's in New York City. Their history begins in 1827, when a pair of Swiss brothers, John and Peter Delmonico, invested $20,000 in gold coins to open a café they called Delmonico's. Originally serving French pastry, by 1831 they had evolved into a fine French restaurant. There at Delmonico's, many classic American dishes were invented, such as Eggs Benedict and Lobster Newberg. But it's important to note that while Delmonico's is the oldest restaurant in the nation, it has changed hands several times. But here in New Orleans, Antoine's restaurant, second to Delmonico's in age, is still the oldest continuously operating family-owned restaurant in the U.S., thanks to Rick and Lisa Blunt, who today keep the home fires burning on St. Louis Street in the French Quarter. I'm Poppy Tooker, and at Antoine's, they're always serving some real Louisiana Eats. New Orleans' Roosevelt Hotel enjoys a rich history, spanning more than 125 years. Opening in 1893 as the Grunewald Hotel, it was lavish from the start. It's even rumored that Huey Long planned the construction of Airline Highway just to shorten his travel time from the state capitol in Baton Rouge to the Roosevelt Sazerac Bar and Huey's favorite Ramus Gin Fizz. Imagine our surprise to find that on Mondays in that grand establishment, they're frying chicken. Chef Carl Cushenberry recently invited me into his kitchen to show me a little something about how he creates his legendary fried chicken. This is basically flour, flour, and salt. Come this way here, and this is flour and black pepper. See the pepper? Uh-huh. And this is just plain water with uh, something else. See the stuff at the bottom? Yeah. I suspect if you had to ask me, I might guess that there's maybe some cayenne, some paprika. Keep going. Maybe a little vinegar. You smell the vinegar? 
I told him not to put too much in. Do you smell it though? No. There's a vinegar in there, yeah. I'm a cook. Really? So wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You have a degree in cooking and you don't know how to fry chicken? I, I went to that fancy French cooking school, you know. I, yeah, I, they took I can your money? do it, but I Did can't. Did they take your money? Yeah, they took my money. And you don't know how to fry chicken? I got robbed, huh? Yeah. All right, well, I hope. I hope you, you're gonna you want to you want to learn how to fry chicken? Yes, sir. Today. Today. Right now. Today you gonna learn today, babe. I said that. Yeah. Okay. Now you can watch, but don't ask no questions here. Yes, sir. Whatever you say. It's your kitchen. It's your rules. Uh huh. Going in the flour. In the flour. You gotta learn to shake off the excess, cause if you don't, you gonna have too much of flour. People want to eat chicken. You know what kind of chicken this is? Lick Lippin, yeah. good chicken. It's good chicken. Lick Lippin, good fried chicken. That's I right. It would be. This is that bad. I told you it got flour, flour, or something else. Yeah. This is it here. It's a different type of flour that we get from in New York, we are somewhere over there. But we mix with that to make the chicken crunchy. It's flour, and it's your secret ingredients that right, you're right. not sharing. Right, right, okay. right. Okay. You see my taste, though, William? Step over here. Look at my food taste. He's your food taster. He only weighed 110 pounds when he got here. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good co-worker of mine. So, so therefore, you know we doing good with chicken. You feel me? So now, fried chicken this comes with a, a good, clean deep fry. So that's fresh grease. Make sure your grease is hot enough and it's set at the proper temperature. And what's the proper temperature? Not at 350. Right before 350 here. Right before 350. Yeah, because at 350 to get too dark. So about what, 340, 340 345? Yeah, somewhere around that range. I've never told nobody else this here. When I start putting all that chicken in this deep fry here, the key thing is you put it in there and you let it sit. And you don't touch it? Don't touch it. Let it cook for about five minutes. That way, the crust and the flour will uh -huh. firm up. And once you get them firm up, you can start to rotate it. Rotate it while it's in here. And that way all the chicken will be start cooking, right? Does that make it good makes sense? Total sense? Yeah, don't you think that when you put the chicken in the oil, if you move it around too much, for one thing, it absorbs the oil. Exactly. That's what I think. Right, right, right. So and if you're getting it in there and you're getting that hard surface, you're sealing it up correct. so it can't absorb the right, oil, right? Right, right, right. right. Let me know when we go to commercial here. How much chicken do you fry here on a Monday on average? Well, due to the fact they just started this here, every Monday it gets different. Uh, last week we did about two cases of chicken. So this week we're hoping to do maybe two and a half. See how that one's starting to float? Yeah. That guy over there. And you're going to see that leg. It's going to turn upside down. It's a beautiful color. Look, mm -mm. you see that leg right there? I see it. It's almost there. And look at that thigh. Look. It's look beautiful. How pretty it is. Oh, it's gorgeous. Want to take a picture? After I took some lovely photographs of Carl's lip licking fried chicken, we retired to a large dining room to finish our lesson and eat a little fried chicken. Carl, how did you start here at the Roosevelt? Are you from here? Yes, ma'am. So, where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up at Uptown, off uh, Chabatula's in Napoleon. Did you ever have any idea you were going to end up at the Roosevelt in the kitchen? No, it ain't like I sit down and say, well, I want to learn how to fry chicken and be, be, be the best at it. No, uh, you know, because I was watching a program last night, and, you know, like a guy, he, he's, a, he's a sports player. He said his parents asked him a long time ago when he was about 13 years, Billy, what you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I want to play bad baseball all my life. I want to strike out something all my life. And I thought about it. I said, well... Nobody asked me what I wanted to do when I was a youngster, but I had the opportunity to come into this fine establishment here. Been here since the Fairmont days. Since the Fairmont, how many years is that, Carl? Ooh, ooh that's about what? I'd say about 16 years ago. I was given a job as a pot washer and I used to help the cooks do what they had to do, so I asked the banquet chef, which his name was uh, Benny Diaz, I asked him to uh, move me to a cook's position because I did help out when I didn't have no pots to do so. They gave me an opportunity and I ran with it. 
What's your day like here, Carl? You come in at 4 a.m., and what do you do at 4 o'clock in the morning? Well, sometimes I'm a banquet cook, so we have banquets. And we have banquets for maybe 2 to 4 people, or 10 to 12 people, or 12 to 24 people, and 24 to 100 and some people. So we do banquets, lunch, and dinner. So everything you've learned, you learned on the job. Correct. The chicken? Now, how did you learn the chicken? Well, uh, working in banquets, uh, I just figured I wanted to do something different with the chicken uh, at, at the time of the Fairmont. And uh, they gave me the opportunity to do so, and I uh, did something different, and everybody liked it. So now we're trying to do something here at the Roosevelt with this chicken thing uh, before I retire. So, Carl, I understand that part of the fried chicken story goes back to a Mardi Gras. Yeah. The Roosevelt knew I knew how to fry chicken good. And it's something that we wanted to promote for Mardi Gras season. What we did was we fried chicken upstairs and we sold it out the restaurant that's over there that's on the other street over there. And we gave a bucket of chicken to everybody that was standing in the hotel, a bucket of chicken and a can of beer or whatever. Uh-huh. And it sold well. Favorite thing I like to be created with is chicken because there are major things you can do with chicken. I know about 700 and something, 99 pieces of way to do something with chicken or you can do a lot with chicken. What are some of your other things? What are your other chicken tricks? I can't tell you. You got to sign a contract with the Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm sincere. We okay. got to sign papers. It's secret. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But what I want to present to the judges on uh, at the Fried Chicken Festival is I want to serve them with something different, something you never heard of. You say you cook before. You told me that earlier. Yeah, I'm a cook. But it's something that I want to present to them. I could tell you because you can't do it, even if I do tell you. Oh, I'm sure I can't. You can, you know, that's the thing about recipes. I tell people recipes. I tell them how to do things. But, you know, don't you think some of this magic, Carl, is in your hands, it not is. in your head? It is. It is because, you know what, the Michael workers, they're always locking around me trying to see how I fry chicken. They can't do it, though. They try to. But what I'm going to do for the judges at the chicken fest is fried chicken and red beans and rice on a stick. It's the red beans and rice are stuffed inside the fried chicken on a stick. Can wow. it be done? It's been done by me. Well, you are something else. I sure am. Thank you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for recognizing. Well, I have a feeling you and your chicken are going to go far. And I'm thrilled that I had this chance to get this behind-the-scenes look and taste. I can hardly wait to taste that chicken. Oh, my goodness, this is life-changing good chicken, Carl. I'm glad it's changing your life right about now, dear. Oh, my goodness, it is. Ch- I, there is no chicken in my lifetime that's going to ever measure up to this moment. You've ruined me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being ruined. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Hey, you're so welcome. That's Chef Carl Cushenberry of the Roosevelt Hotel. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Have you visited poppytooker.com lately? That's where you can hear our new Quick Bites podcast and also order a personalized copy of my new book, The Pascal's Manali Cookbook. You'll find a full list of personal appearances and scheduled signings on the website, too, as well as directions for how to find us. If you've missed an episode of Louisiana Eats, you can hear today's show or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's, Rouse's Markets, Camellia Brand Beans, and from Don's Seafood, where the Landry family has been serving real Louisiana Eats since 1934. Visit Don Seafood at one of their six Southern Louisiana locations. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Shreveport Bossier Convention and Tourist Bureau and from the Bourbon House, from oysters to redfish, serving fresh Gulf seafood and American whiskey on Bourbon Street. Original theme music composed by David Pomerlo and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to senior producer Joe Schreiner, producers Sarah Holtz and Reggie Morris. 
and to our business manager and social media maven, Maddie Mulladew. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eats studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. We're on Instagram and Facebook, too. Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting.